The first Sunday of every year, I had the distinct privilege of preaching here in my home church. And every year, I put on a unique hat, if you wish, that of a seer, a prophet. And for those of you that have no idea what that is, uh, it is, uh, it, it's, it's, a gift or an ability that God gives us. And he gives it to different individuals in different measures. But he gives me a word that helps us step in to the next season. It helps us step in, if you wish, to the new year. And I had the distinct privilege of doing it here first each year. Last year, by way of review... I stood in this pulpit at the same time, and I preached a message entitled, Out of Season. And the reason that I'm reviewing this is that, as I'll make reference to later in this message, there's been a lot of prophetic utterances over this year. <laughs> and most of them have just been wrong. But at the beginning of last year, I stood in this pulpit, and I preached out of Ecclesiastes 11.4, and that passage says, whoever watches the wind will not plant, whoever looks to the clouds will not reap. And it goes on, it says, you cannot understand the work of God. Sow your seed in the morning and at evening. Let not your hands be idle, for you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both would do equally well. And I stood here and I said that we were coming into a moment of being completely out of sync and out of season. And yet the church was coming into its best season. And what was going to be out would be in for the church. How many of you know that happened once or twice? I also mentioned in that same passage or that same message that our reliance on seeking and submitting to the Holy Spirit would be at an all-time high. How many of you have known that we've needed to follow God more closely this past year than in every, any year before? All of the methods and the machinations and, the, and, and all of the things that we've had in place in our own lives or our corporate lives as a church, all of a sudden everything was interrupted and disrupted. And lastly, to sow. To sow. Isaac, it says, sowed in a time of famine. And God did what with him? He increased him a hundredfold. Of all the years not to sow, 2020 would have been one of them. And yet, guess what? Grace Covenant Church, you sowed. As Pastor Tellus says, we had a year beyond every year that we've ever had financially. Almost a million dollars came in to the benevolence offerings alone. Go ahead. That money was not only distributed into our local community, but those monies literally went around the world. You sowed in a time of famine. You heard the word and you obeyed. Thank you. But what now? And I've been living with parts of this message since October of this year. And I believe that God is about three things that he's getting ready to do in our midst. Resurrection, restoration, and restitution. And I believe that we're coming in to a moment that this is about to happen for us. John 11 is one of the perhaps best known, most loved, most popular passage of Scripture. It's about the death and the resurrection of Lazarus. And for the sake of time, we won't read the entire passage. But the story here, of course, is that Jesus had relationship with this affected family. As a matter of fact, it goes into some detail to talk about this man from Bethany, he was the, the brother of, of Mary and Martha, and these were the sisters and the one that poured the perfume on Jesus' feet. I mean, the Bible takes a moment and it unpacks the depth of relationship that Jesus had. 
And it goes on to say that, the, that, that he loved them. And as the report got to him about Lazarus' condition, this was the report, the one you love is sick. Very interesting here. Not someone that you know or you have acquaintance with or you're, you are needed over here. The one you love is sick. Now, if you and I hear that, we get a telephone call. Someone in your family, your mother, your grandmother, maybe someone in your small group that you are in covenant relationship with, what is your very first response? Come on. It's to get up and what? Move. It's to go. It's to do something. Minimally, it is to offer intercession. It's to, it's to get on the phone and offer support or comfort. But what did Jesus do in this moment? It says he waited. He delayed. He stayed where he was for what? Two more days. Now, I don't know about you, but there seems to be a disparity between the one I love and the fact that I'm not even on the giddy up to go and do anything about it. Something's wrong with this picture. And my first point is delay, denial, and determination. You see, saints, many times the greatest expression of divine love is often found in delay. Hear me. The greatest expression of divine love is found in divine delay. And the discernment for us of whether or not something is being demonically resisted and held back or whether or not something is being divinely delayed, we need to know which is which. It's critical. Because often in the delay, this is where the danger comes in the human condition. This is where the damage comes in our relationship. Oh God, where are you in this moment? The despair, the discouragement. And we lose courage. And then what happens? Fear ensues and entraps us. One of the disciples, Thomas, when they finally decide that it's time to go, realizing that there was danger in the very place they were going, and Jesus finally unpacks for these knuckleheads, he's not asleep, guys. He's dead. And Thomas says, oh, okay, great. Let's pack up and we'll just go die with him then. How many of us get to that same place of despondency? That very same place of despair. And culturally, it's where we are right now. You can't pick up anything and not get another death count. We are in the culture of death all around us, and not just in the United States, but globally. We're tracking these numbers like some kind of sports statistic. And we live in the midst of death in this moment. Wow. And when we, when we get fearful, when God is delayed, what happens with fear? It's either what? Flight or fight. Guess what? Boy, we've seen both of those, haven't we? I mean, folks, folks getting ready to go to fisticuffs over a piece of fabric. Or folks just saying, I'm not coming out of the house for the next five years. And we see both responses to where we are. And yet we see ample biblical precedence for divine delay. John chapter 5, a man at the pool of Bethsaida, 38 years it said he had, he had been an invalid. I was in Israel this year, back, actually that would be last year. And we went there. We, we, we saw the place. And, 
And it, it, was, it was a very common spot where Jesus probably came and went on a more or less daily basis. This man had a reputation because he was a beggar there. It says he had, been, he had been this way for 38 years. And how many dozens, if not hundreds of times, had Jesus walked by this man? Wow. John, the ninth chapter. A man blind from birth. And it says a man, not a boy. So this guy had seen the delay of any kind of supernatural intervention on his behalf for his entire life. And then, of course, the story of Lazarus, two more days. And we've all wondered when. I preached a message back in the fall of questions that we don't ask. And how many of you know the question of timing is one that will always get us messed up in God? There are times that God delays and then there are other times that God denies. That God simply says, no. Now, I don't know about you, but as a child, that was a word I did not want to hear. Was no. And primarily, it had to do with food and the proximity to a meal. Can I have? No. I'm going to die. I don't think so, little chunky boy. You are not going to die in the next 10 minutes if I don't let you dive in this bag of Oreos. You're going to be okay. But no is not a word we like much. But there are times that God will not only delay, he will deny. God often doesn't do that, which we ask of him. Why? Because he's about higher purposes of making himself known than just instantly granting our request. Paul, who had a little cachet with God, three times it says over in Corinthians 12, three times I asked him to take this thing away from me, this thorn in the flesh, and God basically said, nope. Because I've got something more significant than the alleviation of your discomfort. I want to show you something about my grace. I want to show you something about myself that in the midst of your pain, you would not get this lesson any other way. My goodness. And in the case of Lazarus, Jesus' delay resulted in his death. Talk about an ultimate denial. And the accusations begin to fly. Mary, Martha, if you had been here, oh my, I wonder how many times over the past 10 months, if you had been here, I wouldn't have lost my job because of this virus. If you had been here, my family member would not have died. If you, how many times have we accused? Oh, we may not have come out and said it quite the way that Mary and Martha said it to Jesus in that moment. Maybe we've uh, uh, accused the political process or the medical community or the financial markets or whatever. But there's been accusation and ultimately it has been directed at God. That somehow he's been less than in the whole process. Jesus got in the midst of all of the pain. And it says he wept. He wept. He was overcome because of that which he had ordained was causing pain to those he loved. Isn't that the weirdest thing you've ever heard? You mean... Jesus, God himself stepped in. He saw those weeping and mourning. And it says he himself wept. Because he knew that that which he had determined in advance, he was going to do on that day, in that moment, was causing all of this grief. Some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? You see, God knew what he was going to do. He had something higher in mind. 
The account in John 9 of him opening the man's blind eyes when they were trying to figure out who do we blame? It says this happened that the word of God might be displayed in his life. The same way that he told his disciples after he was real sure that his friend Lazarus was really good and dead. Crass, but that's what he was doing. No, he wasn't asleep. He wasn't in a coma. He's dead. Now we can go. Because I've set up a miracle. It is for God's glory. So that God's son might be glorified through it. And notice the narrative now changes from Lazarus and the need of Lazarus to the glory of the son of God. Subject and object have now reversed. It's not about Lazarus anymore. It's about Jesus. It's about God being glorified in the impossible. Wow. You see, in the delay and in the denial, there's a determination that God's about to do something that we've never seen before. But many times, he'll take it all the way to my second point, to death. Oh, my goodness. And as I've already mentioned, we've lived in a culture of death as a result of this pandemic. Most of us have been affected some way. Whether it's the virus has been in our household or someone has died as a result or someone's lost a job. or Most of us in this room have been affected, some prof profoundly, excuse me. And there's something about death is that it has a unique odor. I, I, this, this is a bit unsavory to talk about, but you, you can tell something's dead because it smells very bad. Mm. Jesus was about to do that, which he had determined in advance he was going to do. And they were about to move Move the rock away from the tomb. And, they, and, and, and those there were protesting. Oh, but you don't want it. Oh, this is bad. He's already been here four days. And in this heat, he's, he's already, he, the decomposition's already begun. And, and Lord, as it says in the KJV, he stinketh. <laughs> what stinks around your life right now? Congratulations, because that odor is an incense. Listen to me. It's not just our worship. It's not just our prayers. But there's an aroma of death that uniquely reaches the nostrils of God that he says, now, now I can do something. Now, the medical community, the financial markets, the preachers, oh, now nobody can take credit for it because it's really dead. Now I'm going to be God. Watch this. Oh, my goodness. And the kingdom principle that you cannot get away from you cannot have resurrection unless you have prerequisite death. We all want the resurrection power of God the way that Paul prayed that beautiful prayer in Ephesians, the first chapter. I pray that you would know this power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We all want the power. We just don't want the circumstances that demand the power. Oh, my goodness. And you've got to acknowledge death for real life to come forth. Let me tell you, four days was long enough that all of the doubters, all the naysayers, he stinketh. Everything that we know about physiology and everything we know about the human condition, this man is dead. Yet we're terrified many times to say to God, it's dead. 
Oh, we've got so many, we got so many different ways that we try to resuscitate. And God is saying, if you will step back, if you will step off, I'll be God. I've told this story before, but in the late 1980s, my wife and I was, I was running a business and not, not, not doing a real good job of it. God was calling us out of that into ministry. We were in debt. It was impossible. And then the Internal Revenue Service came and just shunk. I mean, just speared us. I mean, we, oh my goodness. And I remember coming home, getting the letter, you owe us. And, and it, it, may have, it may well has been, have been $20 million because we didn't have it. We didn't have it. And I came and I told my wife, we're dead. We are the financial walking dead. We are financial corpses, baby. We broke. There's nothing I can do. There's not another Visa or MasterCard. There's no balance transfer out there. We are deadbeats. We're done. And I got happy. Partly because I was insane. Partly because I was terrified. What else she going to do? But then I realized, finally, my finances were dead enough that only God could do something about it. In six months, we were out of debt, IRS was paid, and we were in ministry. Because we acknowledge death so we could acknowledge God. Because there was no other way. I had nothing left. Wow. Lord, if you'd been here, if you'd been here, Mary, do you, do you believe? Do you believe your brother will rise again? I know he will rise in the resurrection. So now... We have a little theological discussion happening now between, between Jesus and between Martha. And you see, God is about moving all of our theoretical theology and making it experiential theology. You know, I appreciate arguing somebody into the kingdom. I appreciate apologetics. I appreciate, you know, all of the, of the techniques and the machinations. And my wife and I have been around the church for a moment. We've seen different evangelistic methods come through every home for Christ. And I mean, all of the, and they're all great. But somewhere we've got to move all of this theoretical into the experiential. Jesus' encounter with a woman at the well, she wanted to engage the God of the ages about worship. I mean, you know, it's probably not wise to discuss theology with God. Oh, yes, I know that my, your, our ancestors worshiped them. <laughs> woman, if you knew who was talking to you right now, because I can show you some water that you'll never have to go get again. Oh, I want me some of that. Bet you do. You see, what we need and what the world must see is this faith, this Jesus experienced, not just verbally expounded. They need to see something. And that happens largely, and this is my last point, through demonstration. 1 Corinthians 15, and I wish I had time to talk more about this, but Paul is writing a very logical exposition here about resurrection. And his primary point here is that if there is no resurrection, then it, it's, it's over here, boys. Everything that you believe, everything you preach, every basis of your faith, everything you've built upon, if Christ was not resurrected from the dead, we're the most pathetic suckers on the planet. Because this is the bedrock of everything that we build on is resurrection. It's why it says further on in 1 Corinthians, it says the last enemy to be destroyed is what? Come on, you know this. Death. 
And yet, central tenet of our faith is resurrection. Other faiths have deities. They've got sacred texts. They've got codes of ethical living. They've got rewards and, and, and punishments and liturgies and worship. There are other religions in the world that have this. But resurrection is unique to the three major monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Unique resurrection. And in the early church, that was the buzz. Resurrection. You're going to be resurrected. I'm going to be resurrected. And if you think about the one teaching that got Jesus and his disciples in the most trouble, it was what? Resurrection. It was the resurrection of the dead. Why? Because the enemy knows that that last enemy that he holds over our heads is the fear of death that once that one's gone, he's finished. That's why the, the teaching, that's why the understanding of resurrection is so critical to everything else that we believe. And yet, we barely hear anything about it in the pulpit today. It's not a buzz. It's not even a thing. Hmm. Wow. And Lazarus, a dead man who is no longer dead. What are you going to say about that? The same way that they drug Peter and John in, in front of the Sanhedrin and, and they're saying, this man, and they're teaching all of this heresy and yet here's the man that they had healed, a crippled. What could they say? Gamaliel says, if you try to stop this, <laughs> you're going to find yourself fighting what? Against God. Because there was the man who just moments earlier could not walk. Now he can't. What you going to say? Same way, Lazarus comes out of that tomb. Here he is. He was dead. He was decomposing. And now here the man is. What are you going to say? Wow. And as God had glorified his son by raising Lazarus, there was yet still a human component to the completion and the manifestation of Lazarus' healing. Jesus cried out and says, Lazarus, come out, come forth. He says, the dead man came out. That ought to just arrest us right there. The dead man came out. What dead man needs to come out of your life? And I'm not talking about the old man, the sin nature. I'm talking about that on the inside of you that God needs and wants to resurrect in this moment. Hmm. But he still had his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth across his face. And Jesus said to those around, take off his grave clothes and let him go. Could I describe to you that is the church. You can't bring anybody from death to life. You don't have that power. But what God has uniquely given the church is the ability to unbind those that God has chosen and raised from death to life. Amen? It is a unique function of the church. How do we unbind? What does that look like? Well, you know, we believe in, you know, uh, deliverance and emotional healing and you need counseling. No, that's not what I'm talking about. It might be part of it. But everyone here, you don't have to be, have a seminary degree or be a ministerial monster to unbind something that has been binding somebody up. A wrong thought pattern, a wrong understanding about who they were. Get those stinking claws off of one another. God had done the heavy lifting with Lazarus, but Lazarus still couldn't do much more than this. To get out. He was ready to go. He was ready to run. And let me tell you, the church has a role in this. 
starts with us. Within the church, God has placed certain folk, prophets, Many times they point out the gap. They, they, they point out this is, this is the, what's missing. And then you've got the priests that bridge the gap. And then you've got the pastors that heal the gap. And guess where all of these folks are found? Right here in the church. Resurrection. Then there's restoration. I believe one of the great challenges for the church in this moment is its reputation. And the political process and the factions that have been created in our country has greatly fractured the church. And that's not a blue, red, Democrat, Republican statement. That's just a statement of fact. The church is fractured right now. Prophets that have made predictions that simply were untrue. Further straining the credibility of the church. The very institution that God has created. A living entity, body, family, group of folk assembled together to represent something of heaven on the earth. The only ones that can truly unbind our credibility has been strained in this moment. More gifted exegetes of the word and means of communicating it will also not accomplish that which God intends. Why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2 is my message was not with wise and persuasive words or a new Instagram account or a banging website, but with a demonstration of the power of God. So that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on what? God's power. Demonstration is no longer an option for us, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to me. Oh, but we got Pastor Brett. He can, oh, he can preach the paint off the wall. I know that. Great. Wonderful. But as great and effective as it is, could I submit to you? That we have the best and the best isn't enough. We need a demonstration of the power of God. Touching people's lives. In an unmistakable way. I was dead, now I'm not. I was sick, now I'm not. I had no idea what a spiritual gift is or was. Now I talk in tongues more than all of you. It's a mandate. Middle part of the year, as I was getting the timing of all of this wrong, like so many of my other compatriots, God told me at that time, he says, I'm wanting to birth the church into a new Pentecost. A new Pentecost. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that we discover nine more spiritual gifts. But the church was originally birthed by the outpouring and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. It's how it started. And it's how God intended for it to be sustained by many signs and wonders being done by the apostles. It wasn't just a koinonia. It wasn't just the fact that folks were living together in a, in a harmonious way. It wasn't just the teaching. It says many signs and wonders were done among them. Wow. Saints, listen to me. The greatest threat to the church are not those external forces, whether natural or spiritual, that everyone is so worried about. In my wife's and I early days, it was secular humanism. <laughs> and now we've got all these other forces that we're so terrified about. The new barbarians at the gate. This spiritual thing, this demonic thing out there. Ooh. Could I just tell you, that's not the greatest threat to the church. It's building without the acknowledgement and power of the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest threat to the contemporary church. Is a church being built aside from the Holy Spirit. Because you know what we get then? The Tower of Babel. Man building a glorious man monument to himself. At everything that he can build. And do you not think it unusual 
that in this pandemic, one of the great towers of church building, our ability to meet together, have beautiful services and buildings and all of the stuff that we've relied on, all of a sudden now, globally, it was taken away in an instant as a result of a virus. Who would have thunk? Why do you think God is doing this? He's wanting to get us back to something granular, something organic, something of its original form. He's wanting to birth us back into a church that's led and endued with the power of the Holy Ghost. And then lastly, restitution. And I hated to even add this one because sadly, there are many folks that will grab this one and grab nothing else. But I'll be obedient and I'll share what God told me to share. This has been a unique season of loss. No question. But there's a promise that says, as you've sown in tears, come on, you will reap in joy. Job 42. 41 and a half chapters of God tearing a man to pieces. A righteous man. The most righteous man God could even point out. And then God just ripped his life to pieces. It's a problem. It's a problematic (laughs) part of the Bible. But specific promises came to Job there as God restored him. Restitution came. It says he got twice as much as he had before. And Job was wealthy. Relationships were restored. He had real wealth. Somebody was counting, and I mean, they, 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 had his, they had his bank account numbers in there. How many heads of this and livestock? I mean, it was powerful. Unusual fertility. Ten kids. Ten children. And I believe this is reflective. That's a rate of reproduction that marks God's hand. We're going to see reproduction begin to happen. Even as a result of being torn and scattered What the church has been through, we're going to see reproduction come at the greatest rate we've ever seen before. I believe it. Generational promises. And this is a fascinating passage because there were seven sons, three daughters, and yet we find Job naming his daughters very, very unusual, unprecedented. And we find the daughters receiving inheritance alongside their brothers without their brothers' death. Very unusual. And the fact that it was so specifically inscripturated. You go and you look and you see how unusual this was. But there was something about the blessing on Job's life that he wanted to say, we're not bound by whatever the tradition was in the past. I want this blessing to extend across my entire household. Wow. The blessings on the latter part of his life and long life, old and full of years. This is what Job got back in restitution. In closing, Matthew quoting Isaiah. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Let me give you a word on timing. If all of this doesn't happen tomorrow, please don't show up at my house with rocks. You know, it's an interesting thing about a dawn is that the light comes up, what? Gradually, incrementally. To the point that you know that darkness is yielding to light, but at what point do you say we're fully in the day? And I believe this is a word that probably we won't see completely fulfilled in 2021. But I believe that there is a light dawning. And I believe we will begin to see the first vestiges of this. And saints, I'm not tying this to the release of a vaccine. I'm tying this to a word from heaven. But we need to be circumspect about this. What needs the resurrection power of God in your life right now? And I'm not just talking about things in your physical body, but what died in you this last year? What hope, what dream, what desire, 
What trajectory? What words that you had in and of your life that you felt like somehow the enemy had come and managed to kill? What needs to be resurrected in and around your life? Figure it out. Acknowledge death and then let resurrection get to that, that very spot. What died? And as with Lazarus, God is a resurrection God. There's nothing so dead God can't get to it. He's coming to resurrect, to restore that which has been damaged and restitution to what has been temporarily lost over this past season. And listen, as you press into this word, God himself. Let me tell you, you're going to hear the same way that those heard what Lazarus heard. Come forth. And I believe that's a message for the church in this moment is to come forth. Pray with me. I want to start right here. At the very beginning of a new year, if you don't know that you know that you know that Jesus has selected you, chosen you for life, not for death, this is your moment to acknowledge that choosing. To exchange everything that stinks around your life, everything that's dead, dying, a lot that needs to just die. And you want to exchange it for real life. It begins with an acknowledgement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And if that's you, slip your hand up. If you're watching online and that's you, just acknowledge this. Pray this prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that the life I've been living is no life at all. That you declared about yourself that you were the way, the truth, and the life. Not an option, the only one. Lord, forgive me. I confess to you, I've not lived the way I should. I can't, I've tried. But I ask you, forgive me. Step into my life and I'll live for you as you live in me. If that's you, there's some folk that can help you in the next steps. You'll get some instructions on screen. If you're here live this morning, some folks can out in the lobby will put something in your hands to help you with those next steps. If you prayed that prayer a long time ago and you just say, Pastor Jim, there are things in my life I know God needs to touch. He needs to resurrect. I've lost hope. I don't see it. I'm discouraged. This is your message. The word of the Lord to you is, Come out and come forth. And God's going to meet you with resurrection, with restoration, and with restitution. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this great church. God, we love you. Let us hear well, but let us respond better. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, church. Thank you.